So we're gonna start now with um, a discussion on how COVID-19 and the EU's new foreign direct investment policy intersect and what we're learning about that for international economic law. Uh, let's briefly introduce ourselves. My name is Tara Van Ho. I'm a lecturer at the University of Essex School of Law and Human Rights Center, where I specialize in how businesses impact on human rights and what investment law protection does to that dynamic. So Luis. Um. Hi everyone, my name is Luis Eslava. I work at Kent Law School uh, and I teach and research on social legal approaches to international law and uh, development. And Celine. Hi, I'm Celine Tan. I'm a uh, reader in law at the School of Law, uh, University of Warwick in the UK, and I work primarily on the intersections between international economic law and development with a focus on international development finance. So, Luis, you want to give us the background? Uh, thank you. Um, so, I was given the task to introduce uh, 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 something that we've just been witnessing over the last uh, week or so um, uh, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, but more broadly across the world, uh, all the way from uh, the US to Asia, uh, passing through Latin America. And, and this is uh, uh, something quite unexpected. Um, uh, it is expected if we it take the pandemic in mind and so a kind of current uh, frame of reference, but unexpected if we, we take what, uh, what has been the orthodoxy in international economic law over the last 30 years. Um, so uh, the issue here is the question of protectionism. Uh, so for a long time, international economic law, uh, international institutions, uh, in particular, international financial institutions have um, uh, have have created a, a, a common sense, and we have been talking about common sense in in the series of um, the IEL collective. Uh, common sense uh, predicated on the basis that the way to achieve economic stability and prosperity and ensure the welfare of national populations was by uh, opening uh, the um, um, trade, uh, the, opening the um, uh, countries to trade flows and financial flows and welcoming uh, international investment. Uh, that uh, common sense is, uh, uh, has, is being uh, contested systematically uh, at this uh, point. Uh, for example, um, yesterday we saw the European Commission uh, announcing that not only they were uh, ready or prepared or were considering um, um, halting in, uh, foreign direct investment within the region, but was actively uh, uh, calling member states to, to use any mechanisms available to um, ensure uh, the protection of national industries. Uh, the wording of uh, the European Commission is very telling um, uh, because of the assertiveness and the clarity of it. Uh, about it. Um, so they, uh, according to the president of the European Commission, or Ursula uh, von der Leyen, um, uh, the EU uh, was calling uh, member states to protect uh, industries, in particular key industries, including health, medical research, and strategic infrastructure. Uh, the European Commission said that it had to be uh, pay special attention uh, who invest from abroad. Um, and this is especially important when we are uh, more vulnerable. And these are her uh, words. And, and, and what she called was uh, to two different kind of approaches to foreign investment. Uh, one is what is technically called a screening foreign direct investment, basically making an assessment, one-to-one, -one, uh, case-by-case -case assessment of who is investing and in which industry, industries and, and proceeding on the basis of whether uh, that investment has the potential to affect uh, one of these kind of key areas, health, medical research, or strategic infrastructure, or maybe the, the, the ability of these countries to respond to the current crisis in other industries or through other industries. And, and, and then in particular, she called for countries that had not those screening mechanisms in place to implement them. Uh, so, um, this is this is this is this is this is this is very uh, important um, for the IEL collective and for the conversation that we're going to have here. It is important for two things. One is the one that I had already uh, outlined that this 
runs against um, the accepted orthodoxy uh, that have come to dominate international economic law uh, thinking for the last 30 years. But secondly, it is important because the measures that we have seen uh, being taken at the moment are exactly the measures that developing countries and emerging economies have been calling for over the last, uh, again, 30 years. Um, so uh, the, the point uh, that uh, developing and emerging economies have uh, been calling for is something that, uh, and Celine, I'm sure, is going to talk more about it, is, is, is what we call in, um, in the jargon of international economic law, um, policy space, okay? So these countries have been saying, hang on, I mean, you know, we want to engage in the business of economic growth, but we need uh, 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 some space in order to be able to enact policies that suit our uh, uh, internal needs, in particular, uh, attending to the social uh, pressures that all, every single of developing and emerging states have been facing over this period. Um, uh, and secondly, they have been calling, and this is a call that goes back to the 1970s, uh, what we also call technically in the, according to the jargon of international economic law, uh, developmental sovereignty, okay? So not just only a question about policy, but let us think about what is the most suitable framework that can help us to achieve development, a development that is most suitable to our needs. Those claims have been uh, systematically, um, uh, and got, uh, um, the, the international economic order have not paid attention to those claims. And when those claims have been advanced uh, by individual countries, uh, that have, they ha th th making those claims have brought with themselves a huge amount of disciplinary measures because they have been seen as being um, a, a kind of a, a back, a kind of backpedaling the, um, the expansion of the process of globalization. Uh, it has been uh, condemned and uh, damaging and attacking uh, consumer interest. Uh, and most importantly, have been uh, kind of uh, married with claims that when, uh, for example, national interest is being put in the table, it is because of political interest, okay? So anyway, so there's a, a few ideas um, to start the conversation. Okay, so now we're just gonna talk like we normally do. So Celine, tell me something. Yeah, so I just, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy times, right? Guys, yeah. it's 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 um it's really incredible that the um things that we uh, have been saying for years um, and we've been seeing for years in the global south um, really is happening. You know, um, in countries uh, that have, like Lewis said earlier, traditionally um, implemented the you know or, or re resisted the implementation of these policies um, for global south countries when they were in similar situations. Um, and in, in some ways, I think uh, what this pandemic does is it brings to the fore, it certainly highlights um, the asymmetries within the sort of international economic um, legal architecture that, um, you know, has been present uh, throughout the post-colonial period. So this is not like a new development, as Lewis said. Um, you know, international law in itself was was founded on an asymmetry. Um, the institutions and the rules of international economic law have always privileged those that were responsible for the design and you know, uh, and implementation, uh, and who, those countries which uh, control the institutions, and not just countries, but certainly communities, because certainly you know, uh, I think you and Lewis talked about it in your previous conversation that you know there is uh, you know that there are certain uh, segments of the global community that hold power within you know societies and within the global society and those are the segments of the global community that have been responsible for the design and control of the institutions uh, that you know uh, make these rules up for uh, everybody else to to live upon and i think you know the whole um you know the the whole uh, response, I think, by uh, the Western states, um, as exemplified by the European Commission um, uh, yesterday in yesterday's decision, 
um, certainly, you know, highlights one aspect of this, which is that 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 kind of notion of policy space that that Lewis, you know, kind of uh, uh, talks about, which which I guess, you know, um, and and then policy space is, is such a technical term, right? Like, so you know, we talk about it, we we assume everybody knows what it means, um, but what does it actually mean? So it actually just means the you know the the capacity of countries basically and governments to set and implement domestic strategies to support um, you know development and public um, uh, interest uh, objectives, right? Like poverty reduction, economic growth, access to public services, climate change, adaptation, mitigation. Um, and in this case, it responses to public health emergencies, all right? Um, so in, in many ways, I think, you know, it encapsulates this kind of like two ideas, right? That, that, you know, we are, countries are sovereign and should be sovereign to take the steps that they need to do to protect populations in a global economy. But also, we're very cognizant that, you know, these restrictions in a globalized economy also has ramifications, right? And, and, and so I go back to kind of like the old Bretton Woods kind of, you know, founding um, issues. And we, we do have a lot of issues about, you know, the Bretton Woods architecture and the foundations of the Bretton Woods architecture. But certainly one of them was this kind of like the need to balance between multilateralism, globalization, and the capacity of countries uh, to retain this right to regulate, to retain the right to impose uh, restrictions when you know the global flows of goods services you know have I I impact on 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 the ability to protect communities within borders and, and I guess this kind of raises the, the issue of you know many things including borders you know multilateralism internationalism development cooperation and and all these various issues so something you just said now really struck a chord with me in terms of the how the original architecture was intended to allow for this balancing. Balancing that has essentially gone out the window for every state in the world, including now the European states. Um, and, and I don't really celebrate that, but there's a part of me that's really glad that it's happening to the European states now because maybe we will finally get the reform that we need. Um, I'm not, I'm not convinced about that. We're going to come back to that question in a second, but, um, I, when we talk about how this goes back to the defense of necessity discussion that Luis and I had in the last video, when we talk about the limitations that we place on when states can breach their, their international obligations, particularly towards corporations, because enforcement of human rights is extraordinarily limited. But the enforcement for corporations and by corporations is quite robust. When you have constrained our, the ability of states to respond to things so severely as what we've seen with the jurisprudence on the defense of necessity, where it has to be the only way in which a state could have responded. It has to be something that the state didn't contribute to, meaning the state didn't adapt any relevant public policies beforehand. You are essentially not talking about the defense of necessity, but essentially force majeure, right? It has to be an earthquake coupled with a tsunami, coupled with, um, it can't be a nuclear disaster because if it's a nuclear disaster, then the, then the state was involved in building the nuclear power plant, so therefore we're out of that, right? So it's such a limited scope that it almost seems like it almost seems like we've created a system by which there is no, it's not just that there's no policy space, mm. but any policy use um, is going to, to cause problems for states. Essentially, there should be no governance. There should be no good governance within the international economic order. Um, and I don't really know how we unravel that now that we recognize, now that the people who needed to recognize the problem finally are starting to recognize it. Um, so. I just wanted to respond to that, Tara, really. Um, and I think, I think what's really also important for us to kind of bear in mind, I think it's really gr great that we are seeing this kind of, in a way, um, I hesitate to use the word, but, you know, hypocrisy that is being demonstrated, right, by, certainly by, by, by the northern states, because they're taking the same, you know, they're, they're, they're invoking the same kind of, you know, uh, narratives and, and then the, the, the reason, rationale for imposing these kinds of restrictions, which they would always challenge, you know, countries in the south for doing in the past, right? But one of the things that I would caution um, us to say, well, is this actually, you know, something uh, to kind of celebrate, to, you know, uh, going forward is that 
I think it's even now, right, at a critical juncture, we still see the narrative of the exception being played, that these are still exceptional circumstances, because if you still see that, I mean, they, you know, they're taking these measures, but at the back of it, there is still this kind of underlying message that this is a temporary measure, and when it's all okay, we're going to return back to the markets. And I think that's not right, right? Um, because if you look at um, uh, certainly the World Bank, um, you know, with their, and, and the IMF, with their announcement of the financing for um, developing countries this week, um, the additional level of financing um, um, uh, to developing countries. But they were very, very clear that, you know, this, you know, we're going to extend this financing, but you're still going to have to have, you know, uh, uh, implement the, the structural adjustment policies, right? Which actually directly contributed to the, you know, like the, the basically the decimation of a lot of public health systems across the world um, in developing countries and the capacity to deal with pandemics, right? Um, so we've got to in, in, in the way that we celebrate, so I think what, what we as I think international economic lawyers um, and scholars of international economic law have to do now is actually to look at this um, and say, well, no, the system wasn't working before. These are not exceptional situations. This is, you know, a situation where, you know, the economic order is, is basically broken and we need to change it. And this is not, you know, these steps that are taken um, are not exceptional measures. They should have been the flexibilities built into the system um, from the start in, in, in order for countries to be able to manage and to implement the domestic strategies that they needed. Um, uh, and, and I think we need to just, uh, uh, in a way, guard um, against and, and push back against this rhetoric of exceptionalism, or like you said, you know, the defense of necessity. It had to be an earthquake before, you know, something so, uh, and, and they are still, you know, at the back of it, it's still there, right? Yeah. No, it is, and I, I really thought um, that at some point we would have grappled with the hypocrisy within investment law. So my favorite case to teach is Mephinex, right? Because in the midst of this decision, and I, I forgot to look at what year it was from, but it's from a, a decade or more. It's from more, more than a decade ago. Um, in the midst of this decision, the arbitrators recognize that regulation and the regulatory sphere within the United States is inherently chaotic. So no one should go into the United States, particularly into California, uh, particularly in an area about the environmental implications, and expect regulatory stability. And it almost acts as if the United States has a monopoly on chaotic legislation, right, or chaotic regulatory space, and we don't. Americans like to think we're exceptional in everything, including this. So when you talk to Americans who travel to Europe for like six months at a time, then they'll come back and tell you how amazing Europe is and how the U.S. is particularly chaotic. We're not. Brexit showed that. The DF in Denmark show that throughout Europe, it's chaos. But it's not just there, it's throughout the world. Regulation is necessarily chaotic um, because it should be responsive to developments on the ground. It should be responsive to our increased knowledge, to our increased understanding of how businesses are impacting on real life. And yet, it's not. All the jurisprudence post Mephinex, none of it picks up on that recognition that legitimate expectations that how corporations understand or recognize or interact with local communities should be on the basis of a recognition that there's there's chaos there's that that it's necessary chaos that it should be responsive chaos rather than just chaos for the purpose of chaos um and so i'm glad that we're seeing the hypocrisy again that we can call it out but i'm worried that what you said is is right that we're going to go back immediately to the status quo and the European states will be able to defend their approach during this period of time. They have the money to do so. Um, and we're gonna see, we're gonna see it really hit, hit states um, like Colombia, like, well, we'll see what happens with Brazil, but like Colombia, Peru, Argentina, um, much more than it hits than it hits European states. It's going to be an, an ongoing constraint against good governance in the future. So I think um, Tara, you and and Celine have kind of got to the core of what would be an argument uh, uh, advanced from international economic law that uh, reveals what is at stake here. So what what will be the final critical uh, kind of patch line of what we're trying to argue here is that the, the ability of declared deception remains in the hands of those that control the international economic order. 
uh, and uh, that's a very Smithian uh, way to say, but that's how it works. Uh, and he's working today, and he's working uh, has been working for for many many years now. Um, so Celine mentioned the, one of those kind of paradoxical, another of those paradoxes that we have seen in recent days. So while the European Commission says these are exceptional times, we're going to take all the measures and we're gonna use the power of the euro and the central bank in order to, to, to push that um, because they have the ability to, to because of the industrial uh, strength and muscles, uh, plus the, the ability to control the internal market to push those policies. Well, at the same time, the World Bank is saying, recognizing that there's a crisis that's gonna affect third world countries, but uh, are only gonna deliver and release uh, funding and, and, and loans uh, on the basis of further liberalization. Uh, so, uh, and, 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 and basically that reveals once again, what Adam Tuzo said, uh, I think last year in a piece published in the London Review of Books, when he said the system is built to discipline the third world through international financial institutions, while it's still allowing a huge amount of leeway to powerful countries, in particular the US, through the dollar. Uh, and the and the and how the Federal Reserve basically uh, it, it, it established monetary policies for the U.S. but for the world. Uh, this is important to is important to to notice. Um, so um, so I think um, that's what one point that I will say. The other one, uh, and I think that, that that is important in terms of bringing clarity to the conversation, is that what we're seeing here is once again a debate about different types of internationalism. Okay, so, so there's two types of internationalism. There's one international kind of cosmopolitanism, which uh, it has been the one uh, advanced by uh, neoliberal interpretations of how the international economic order should be organized. So we all should be one world, um, uh, services and, and goods should flow freely and resources will be allocated by the market. Let it be, if someone lose tough luck, many more, it is believed, will win. Model one. Model two is nationalism. Okay, it's an internationalism based on an endorsement of the national state as the space and as the vehicle to ensure welfare and prosperity. Uh, that model, the problem of our model, is of course that if you belong to a state that is, is strong enough, uh, not just today, but historically has been able to uh, remain strong, uh, that model works for you. For the other one, the state becomes a disciplining agent. Okay, so this is what we're saying, for example, and right now with the World Bank response, you heard, yeah, now you national state, individual national state in Latin America or Africa or the Pacific, you are facing the pandemic, we're going to use the structures of the state uh, to release some money, but those structures are going to be used at the same time to further discipline the collective. Uh, but there's, of course, there's a third, there's a third internationalism, and this is the one that uh, kind of progressive mind in international economic law, in international law, in international human rights law, uh, in international environmental law, in international health law, have been argued for many, many years. And, and we, some, we see some kind of uh, 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 put into practice of that model right, right now. So thanks, uh, thanks the galaxy that we have the World Health Organization. Okay, we tend to forget it, forget about it, which is just another international organization that maybe sits on the corner. And there you go, uh, there's a day when we really need a proper international system in place, being able to coordinate global action. Okay, global action that is a global because we are all at the end of the day humans, we all can perish uh, as a result of being infected by a, a virus. Okay, it is there and it is working and it's doing the work it should do. Okay, so then the question is why uh, we, why powerful actors in the international economic order have been so reticent mm. to accept the importance of having proper mechanisms in place to enact another internationalism. Okay, and an internationalism that, 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 that not necessarily will run against uh, some of the kind of core canon. Um, when you think that that kind of is aligned with welfare and w welfare and security and, and prosperity. Um, 
I think uh, Celine will be able to, to talk more about these, for example, in the case of the IMF. Uh, some people believe, for example, that the IMF it is an example of that kind of progressive internationalism. But uh, you go and see how it works. It is actually the, 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 the assumed disinvestment of money, the ability of, uh, the assumed ability of, of the, the IMF to help countries in need of resources. It is actually not the case because basically what the World Bank is, 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 is sorry, the IMF does is to operate through the basis of, 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 of promises, of, of promises basically, not actually uh, the ability of countries to draw money, so kind of what we, we call technically special, dra special drawing rights, okay, the ability to actually generate effective liquidity in countries. Um, so what you get uh, from the IMF at the end of the day, because it doesn't work in the way it should work, is once again more disciplining measures. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right, Lewis. I think the the third, um, the three internationalisms that you 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 so eloquently um, uh, laid out, I think you know that that's what we have seen and i think i think we're now seeing a kind of bilateral multilateralism and we've seen that you know in 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 many many years of the you know certainly in the last few years but but it's been going on for a while i mean it's it's a form of you know multilateralism that suits certain countries so it becomes a bilateral multilateralism right so where you know countries feel and, and this is in a way it it goes back to you know Braithwaite and Grahorse's uh, forum shifting you know countries that have the power to shift the forum for the design of rules um, that matter to them, uh, they can do it. And powerful actors like transnational corporations will also do that. So where you have the power to shift the regulatory fauna, uh, uh, you do that. And, and countries have done that in terms of intellectual property rights. I mean, obviously, you know, none of us are uh, IP lawyers and, and, and we hope one day to, you know, have one of these conversations with, with our IP experts. Um, but certainly with, with IP, you can see that the, the shift from uh, world intellectual property for, um, organization to the WTO um, for, you know, uh, harmonization of intellectual property, right, regimes, uh, because you have a much more powerful disciplinary section uh, uh, attached to, to, to the WTO, and this is what happens, right, uh, um, uh, when, when, when you look at that kind of uh, multilateralism. Um, which is very specific. And, and going back to, you know, um, I think the WHO, it's just amazing, the World Health Organization, you know, uh, institutions like that and institutions like the United Nations um, are much more democratic, uh, as international lawyers know, in their composition than, than, than institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. I mean, if you look at the governance structure and, and, and uh, uh, who has a voice and who has representation within those structures. Um, and they've been sidelined just, just, just by sheer you know, lack of contributions. And, and this goes back to the, the, the fundamental uh, 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 issue about who funds, you know, these international organizations, the recognition that, that, that you know, um, uh, development finance or financing for global public goods is, has always been premised on this idea of, of, of aid, right? Of philanthropy, of uh, the fact that, of charity, that, uh, oh, wealthier countries are doing this and giving money to, um, less wealthy countries because you know that's a nice thing to do you know it isn't about uh global redistribution of resources it isn't about saying well you know we got rich because of the legacy of colonialism uh the asymmetrical trade rules or the asymmetrical you know investment rules that meant that we have extracted more than we uh, are due, right? Uh, um, I'm from a developing country, but I live in the North. So yes, it's me. So I will use the term we here um, that has, you know, like extracted these, these, these resources. Um, uh, and the then, you know, to say, well, we're not going to fund these institutions. We're not going to help people or communities that we've extracted, you know, labor, capital, um, you know, resources commodities from and give back because that's you know what they do um but rather to kind of condition aid oh we're giving money so we have to condition it and that's the problem because that's the premise of what you know development how development finance operates today right that's how collective action financing operates today it isn't about collective action it isn't about a global commitment that you know we all we're in this boat together so we all have to pay our dues and we have to redistribute the risk and the rewards and the benefits. But what we have is a sense where, you know, um, 
development finance or public finance, international public finance, uh, through the international institutions are, are seen as, as, as a, you know, as a charity, as something that um, we can withhold if we want to, we can impose conditions if we want to, if people don't listen. And that's where you get into the disciplinary conditionalities. Whereas if we shifted our outlook to think about these things as collective action, as redistribution, then I think, you know, that would look very different. The financing of multilateral institutions would look very different. The um, amount of financing that we give to climate change, uh, adaptation and mitigation and environmental ecological disasters, and of course, health pandemics is gonna look very, very different because um, the premise of international cooperation would be very, very different. So we are almost out of time. I wanna to respond to something that you both just said um, and, and a link that I see between what you both just said. Uh, and then I'm gonna come back to you and ask you for what your, your top thing that you wish we could do differently in international economic law, um, particularly in light of these developments. Uh, and then we'll close out. So the thing I wanna say is, Celine, you just talked about how development finance has been treated as, as charity rather than reparations, right? And, and it goes to this issue of what, when do we allow states and when do we hold states accountable, which is what Louis said. And there's this thread that comes through this conversation that that states are willing to accept international global regulation and accountability when it comes to economics, but not when it comes to other issues like human rights and the environmental protections. And I think that a lot of that comes down to this, this really capitalist notion that we separate out what happens in the business sphere from what happens in the personal sphere. So you can be a good business person and make really bad decisions for health, for human rights, for the environment, for communities, and you're still separately a good person because you love your family and you like dogs and you give money to the SPCA. Um, and it, it permeates everything that we do in our society and it's something that we're almost indoctrinated with and I, and I, I hesitate to use that word but I think that it's an accurate word that we're indoctrinated with from, from all different angles. So um, this notion that business and what business does is different. And we have organizational psychology, behavioral psychology that shows that when people go into their jobs, they function differently than they would in the general society. So um, when you are a prison guard in, in the Stanford prison experiments, you treat your colleagues and your classmates in a way that you wouldn't if you were actually sitting in a classroom in a way that you would object to if you were sitting in a classroom and watch that same kind of activity go on. Um, and it's, there's something about that that we need to get to the heart of and start shifting the conversation on. If you are willing to pollute the Niger Delta because it's your job, I'm sorry to say you are not a good person. I don't care how many people you like. I don't care how good you are to your children. You're just a bad person. Sorry. I, should, I probably shouldn't judge people as being bad people. Your actions are bad. You don't get to call yourself a good person unless you reform and do something different and make reparations for what you've done. Meaning you provide compensation, but also you don't do it again. You, you embrace that guarantees of non-recurrence. That's part of the fundamental nature of reparations. Um, but we haven't, we haven't gotten there in the, in, the, in the social discourse. So, you know, I love the movie You've Got Mail. This is going to be a slight diatribe, but I, I promise to come back. I love the movie You've Got Mail, but at the core of that movie is this notion that you should separate the personal from the business, that what we do as economic actors defines our, our, common, our good economic sense. It defines whether or not we're good economic servants, economic leaders, um, and that that's somehow fundamentally different than whether or not you are a good person. And we see that breakdown in the fact in, in every aspect of international law. So um, accountability mechanisms, reparation mechanisms, enforcement mechanisms for, for corporations or by corporations are significant for human rights, for the environment, for protection of the law of the sea. It's extraordinarily limited. And that's because corporations or states are making that same division. They don't want to be held accountable for being bad people because they violated human rights. We're perfectly fine for being held accountable for being bad business leaders um, because that's a separate identity or a separate entity. And I think that's really disturbing. Uh, um, I, I, I'm sorry. No, you, you, so no, I, I would, I would just, what you just mentioned is uh, really interesting. And, and I thought that, that, that I, that's what I um, will help me to, to give my couple of 
um, last points of uh, in terms of what I would like to see next. Um, so I think one thing that I, that I would like to see next is that we need to develop, um, to continue developing uh, a repertoire of ways of moving away from individualism, either in terms of, either in terms of, of individualism as a way of thinking about what are the actions that count and then are valid. So kind of the following the homo economics homo economicals type of, of, of uh, model of, of human beings. Um, but most importantly, how the, the, the individual can no longer be seen as the person um, that we should necessarily blame because what, what we're dealing here is with a structures that regardless of what you want to do, are gonna remain there and are gonna control most of your actions. Um, so for example, uh, we're seeing this in, 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 in this, um, in the responses of the to the pandemic, uh, one one section of the responses has been uh, people don't want to listen the advice by the governments. People continue to go out. People don't respect self isolation. Uh, um, uh, people continue to go to the parks, so on and so forth. But it, 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 and then we we, we get really uh, worked up, and then we really get angry with the individuals because they are so silly. They are not seeing the collective consequences. Um, but we should also ask, maybe we can get angry with the person that, you know, they get too close to us, or uh, especially, um, you know, putting at risk uh, someone, um, an, an elderly. Um, but we also should ask why the government doesn't give proper, clear instructions. Why the government is not there to ensure that people have a, a way to, even as simple as, as queue up uh, outside supermarkets, know how to do it. Um, and I think that this is, this is something that we should remain in the context of international economic law too, uh, because international economic law at the core is a way of organizing the global legal political architecture uh, in terms of how resources are extracted and redistributed. Okay, so and, and, and international economic law in that sense is extremely powerful to make not just uh, uh, um, uh, you know, assessment about who gets rich or who, who, who enriches from a system or who is impoverished, but how to transform that system of um, um, circulations or benefits and allocations of, of rights. Um, and the other thing that I would like to see, and this is a point more uh, uh, me as a, as a social legal, uh, international legal scholar, is that I would like to see something that many um, developmental thinkers have uh, uh, call for a long time, which is we need to continue working on other other models of development. I mean, uh, uh, and another model of development must be possible, or needs to be possible. Uh, so one thing that we are seeing, uh, have been seen in the in recent weeks, is how, um, of course, the people that are outside the formal economy are the ones that are paying the highest risk. Okay, and, and that they're paying the uh, at the most at risk, and then they're gonna they pay are the one, ones they're gonna pay the highest price, um, and and in particular third world countries have become uh, unable because of that lack of public uh, policy space to develop to develop welfare system that are tuned to the resources and the needs that they have. Okay, so, uh, and, and then, and, and this is this is key, you no, know, this is key because it has disabled the states, disable them to respond to modern crisis. So they live with a society that is exposed to modern risk, but they don't have the instruments to deal with it, okay? So again, a country that I know well, Colombia has around 58 million people with, an, with, a, with a level of informality of around 70%. 70% of the population lives in the informal or quasi-informal, or quasi-official economy. How a state in the 21st century can resolve the needs of that population? And this is not just, again, incompetence, okay? Maybe a part of it has been incompetence of the, of the elites in the country and the rapaciousness of the, of, of the country, okay? But it has also been the product of how the world has worked and, and pan out in that uh, particular region of Latin America. So another, another development is, is important. Luis, at some point, I want us to sit down with our friends from Rosario and, and have a very long conversation 
um, that can be broken up into multiple videos about Colombia and about about how international economic law plays out within that context because it's deeply concerning. Celine, final thoughts? You, I can't actually hear you now. Uh, so yeah, just going back to uh, Lewis's uh, point about, um, you know, just the fact that we need to really now understand uh, the role played by international economic law in constituting these structures that have, you know, led to um, this crisis. I mean, it, it's, it's not a I told you so moment. I mean, I hate to use that term, I told you so, or we told you so. Um, because it sounds very judgmental and we're talking about structures here. Um, but I think it is important for us to reflect on the fact that, you know, so many of um, our community have looked at, you know, law as very absent, um, as very um, abstracted from the social, legal, political, um, economic context in which it operates on. And I mean, none of us do. Um, but I know lots of practitioners and other scholars do that, and we need to understand um, that the role played by law is, is really, really important um, in, in, in reflecting, you know, the kind of dominant uh, uh, forms of production, consumption, regulation that we see today, um, but also, you know, by not challenging them, you know, or um, by not um, bringing them to the fore, uh, the, our concerns to the fore, perhaps we in some ways I'm reflecting to see, you know, like maybe we have, you know, failed in some ways, right? Um, but the other point I wanted to make in, in terms of, you know, so A, I wanted people to look more deeply at the constitutive role of law, you know, um, which again, like Lewis says, a social legal scholars who've been saying for, 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 for uh, shouting in the wind for many, many years. Um, the second thing, um, I think it's really important for us also to reflect on, you know, the infrastructures of knowledge, right? Um, because again, why do we think like that? Why do people think the way they do? Why do people abstract law from society? It's because, you know, law schools teach it like that. It's because, um, you know, universities teach it like that. It's a, why do we have orthodox um, economic solutions? Because, you know, business schools teach that, you know, uh, departments of economics do that. So it's about the infrastructures of knowledge. And we can see that panning out in terms of just, the, um, you know, taking one step back from international economic law, but also taking a broader view of international economic law, the responses to the pandemic right now, right? In terms of, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, people talking about why, why, you know, like, you know, there was a two month lead, the East Asian countries were doing this and, and, and now, you know, why have we not got personal protective equipment? Why is there not contact tracing and, and testing and all these things? And I think it's rooted primarily, nobody wants to talk about it, but it's rooted in a particular, you know, kind of Eurocentric mode of, of thinking and learning and producing knowledge that, you know, the East Asian countries have infrastructures of knowledge to deal with infectious diseases, which they have dealt with for, for at least for three decades, certainly with, you know, with SARS, with the avian flu, with MERS. I mean, these are, you know, Asia, East Asian countries have structures um, and, and actually regional mechanisms to, to, to kind of cooperate, you know, might not be as effective, but they're there. Um, lots of countries have infectious diseases controls. In Africa, the, the, they've dealt with Ebola over the last few years, and there have been, you know, there are systems in place. You know, there are public health systems, there are responses that parts of the global south have been, have been implementing and designing and, and working with. Um, and I think this is fundamental to, you know, it's something that really the West has to reflect upon in, in the sense that, you know, whose knowledge counts and whose knowledge is structuring our, even our responses now to epidemics, to crisis, to environmental disasters, indigenous knowledge, you know, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, 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 conversations about indigenous knowledge uh, when we had the Australian uh, uh, bushfires uh, uh, last year in, in December, just before Christmas and after Christmas, right? Um, a lot about, you know, the lack of, of, of appreciation for indigenous knowledge in, in, in terms of conservation and bushfires knowledge and all that sort of stuff. So I think, you know, I think a broader, what I would like us to, to think about is also where our knowledge comes from and, and upon what basis are we making policy and whose evidence counts and whose voices counts and what type 
of methodology we think are acceptable to, you know, formulating responses to any sort of international crisis. I uh, just um, uh, just to remark the obvious um, uh, that uh, Celine just and the point that uh, the obvious point that Celine made. Uh, so we started this conversation by talk about the importance of policy space, and we concluded this conversation by talking about the importance of epi epistemological space. <laughs> so there needs to be a space to think otherwise, otherwise, or, or, and if we don't do so, basically we won't be able to, to, to find the solutions to the problems that we are now all facing across the world. And I just want to add, um, Celine, you touched on one of my things that I wish international economic law were doing differently and that we could learn from this, which is um, thinking of where we get knowledge from. And I would really like to see us start centering the voices of affected communities more and involving them in the decision making process because right now um, it is a conversation amongst elites in every society it's a conversation amongst elites so if you want to give development aid or you want to seek development aid it is your elites that are going and doing it and the conditions by which they make those decisions are through the lens of their own of their own experience their own narratives and their own understanding and that's often not reflective of the reality of the people that are that are going to be affected by those decisions um, and so I would really like to see us find ways in which to center those voices um, and those experiences uh, and bring people into this conversation and help them advocate for their own understanding of, of what the international economic law order should look like. The other thing is I really, um, this is my final, my final wish list thing is um, going back to the very beginning of this, we need to revisit how international economic law involves policy space. Um, and I know that you both have just touched on this as well, um, but how we reflect that in international instruments, how we reflect that in dispute resolution, who's making the dispute resolution decisions um, and how they understand the relationship between policy because um, that is, that's fundamentally at, at the core of what constrains us is how a small group of elite individuals understand the relationship between policy and law. Um, and that's not how it should be. Um, not to sound too simplistic about it, but that really isn't how it should be. Uh, so we really need to, to revise the instruments to take away the power of these small groups of individuals to completely reform and restructure um, the policy decisions of, of elected bodies in a wide variety of, of places. I would say, I would say uh, the relationship between policy and law and policy and law and global life. I think that's, that, that's what is at, at stake here. Yes, absolutely. So on that note, I'm going to call, call this to a close and thank you both so much for doing this. Um, there are links in the captions for our recent article on Medium about, um, about COVID-19 and international economic law. And this will be in a playlist as well so that you can follow along with the other conversations that we're having and other videos that we're having on international economic law. Gener eventually, it will be generally speaking. Right now, it's all COVID-19 related. But at some point, we'll have more general conversations about international economic law and where we need to go. So, follow us, subscribe. I'm not really sure which direction the subscribe button is, but go to that button, subscribe, follow us, um, follow us on Twitter, follow us uh, on Medium as well, and hopefully we'll see you guys soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.